Yeah, I, I make fonts, fonts that look as if they were handwritten, and that's cool actually, I like that. The only problem about, uh, about that is that when I tell people that I make fonts and that I call myself a type designer, they have actually absolutely no idea what I do for a living. So, yeah, I always have to explain myself and I always have to tell them, well, I make, I make fonts like, you know, like Arial or Times New Roman, something like that, only more beautiful. And then they are, yeah, okay, Times New Roman, yeah, okay, I know what you're doing now. <coughs> and, um, yeah, but still, since I specialize on handwritten fonts, a lot of people have actually a quite romantic idea of my daily working routine. A lot of people think that I'm sitting at the desk the whole day with a pen and paper, drawing an alphabet. <coughs> yeah, actually I'm sitting in front of the computer the whole day, producing a piece of software. But besides working digital for most of my time, I have to admit that I absolutely love everything that is handmade, especially when it's handwritten or hand-painted like here. For me, it's just, I don't know, I, I, I feel magically attracted to those kind of things. Maybe because, yeah, maybe it adds so much more value to a design if you have to take a second closer look in order to ask yourself, wait a minute, was there really someone sitting all day long writing the whole text manually instead of just typing it with a computer? Crazy. <coughs> okay, not... Not everyone has a nice handwriting, but I think even this sign, it has so much more charm than when I'm coming into a supermarket and I th see this. Fonts that pretend to be handwritten, but they're obviously not. I mean, you instantly see that this is a font, right? And not that it's actually hand-painted by someone at the supermarket in the morning, but why is that? Also here, why do you instantly see that this is a font? Because letters that repeat look exactly the same. I mean, look at all the E's and these two identical S. I mean, even if you try really, really hard to draw two identical S with a real brush on real paper, you won't succeed. I <coughs> they would always look at least a tiny little bit different. But that's what makes handmade work so charming, right? Yeah, unfortunately, there are a lot of these laughless pseudo brush fonts, which is a pity because thanks to the open type font format, we type designers have the possibility to add 65,536 <coughs> characters into a font. So we can add uh, several alternatives for each letter that look a little bit different, like they would with, uh, if you would draw them with a real brush. And with all these alternatives for each letter, we can give the impression of real hand-painted text. And thanks to open type features, we can shuffle these uh, alternative letter forms automatically so that the graphic designer who uses the font at the end does not have to pick them manually. Unfortunately, not all type designers make use of these possibilities. This font, for example, is the reason why I can't go to McDonald's anymore. Yeah, you're laughing, but for me it's just, it hurts so much. It's not only that there are no alternative letter forms, there's also this dancing of the letters on the baseline to say, yay, it's super handmade, super natural food, no. It's not because it's always the same letters going up or down. So it's always the E being a little bit on top and always the V going a little bit below the baseline. And I don't know why. I mean, it would have been no big deal to write an open type feature to make this dancing look random. But maybe poor McDonald's couldn't afford a, afford a proper typeface, who knows? So I prefer going to Kentucky Fried Chicken instead because they are using one of my typefaces, Libertores. <coughs> so I'm a vegetarian, but um, thanks to this font, this looks super delicious, right? 
<laughs> yeah, but if you now take a closer look on the letters, there are no alternative letter forms as well. So, is there a pointer? Yeah. So all the E's, they look exactly the same. The two R's here, identical. Which is a pity because Libidurus actually has four alternative letter forms, uh, letters, uh, for, yeah, letter alternatives for each letter. So, um, to give the impression of real hand-painted text. And yeah, it's actually a shame that Kentucky Fried Chicken, Chicken did not use them because it was also quite some work adding all these alternatives into the letter. So I painted all letters for Libidurus manually, of course, with a real brush. Real ink, real paper, yay. So actually sometimes people ask me what kind of Photoshop filter I use to get this handwritten impression. Yeah, it's just brush and ink. Um, so, and also the, the font has four styles, regular, italic, bold, and bold italic. And of course, all styles were painted manually uh, and separately and not just interpolated from one style. So. <coughs> There's lots of love in this font. And in order to mix now these four different versions for each letter automatically, we use open type features. In this uh, case, it's a so-called contextual alternates feature. And there are different ways uh, to program this feature. Uh, most handwriting fonts behave like this. Every time you type two same letters in a row, the second one, will be replaced by the alternative version so that you have now two different O's. That's cool. But if you would want to write mama and papa, for example, all the A's would look the same because this cool replacement mechanism would do nothing because there's a different letter standing in between them. And then you would instantly recognize that this is a font. So for my fonts, I always program a more complex behavior where the code in the open type feature does not only look, look at one letter that's standing right before it, but at several letters in its surrounding and automatically detect detects which of the four versions of the A, for example, already uh, appeared and which one was not. So that you have now four different versions of the A. <coughs> the good way of programming the feature like this is that you, in this case, for example, won't be able to tell if this is a font or was actually hand-painted by someone because there are no repeating letter forms. Yeah, of course, the challenge to sustain this this impression of real hand-painted text uh, doesn't only um, apply to one word, but um, the biggest challenge actually is to um, to get to have as less or as little repetitions of identical letter forms also for longer texts. But unfortunately, there are some restrictions that hinder me in that mission. Um, because the stupid thing about the open type feature file syntax is that you can't include a line break into the code. So, every time I type a paragraph, the open type feature code starts all, uh, all, over uh, all over again at the beginning of the line. And if you have a text where the letters at the beginning are um, the same, you get the identical letter forms. So all the th's here look identical. So you can program a super complex and super intelligent contextual alternates um, uh, feature code that uh, works in a very intelligent way and uh, distributes all the alternatives um, evenly. At the end, it's for nothing because the code does not work across lines. And then you would instantly again see that this is, of course, a font. So I thought about a trick to solve this problem. I wrote an open type feature that every time when I um, add a new character at the end of the row, the first letter in the row changes. And so every time you type, the whole character string changes again. That looks like this. <coughs> so this, this does not only result in the dancing movements of the letter forms, but it gives me also a kind of random generator that um, increases the chance that the first letters in the row do look different after all. So we have now three different th's at the beginning of each line. So I outsmarted the limitations of the OpenType feature codes, code with this simple trick. 
Yeah, but you may now think that I'm a little bit nuts because probably nobody will pay attention to that. Nobody will see if the letter forms at the beginning of the row are identical or not. Right? <coughs> yeah, you may be right. But I don't know, for me it's super challenging to get the most out of this rather limited possibilities that a co the OpenType feature code offers me. And um, yeah, it's always a challenge to distribute all these alternatives forms uh, in a, uh, in a mm, intelligent <coughs> as intelligent as possible. So this, for example, is um, the contextual tonight's feature code for my not read yet released Lieber Gartefond. Um, so I always put a lot of effort in um, uh, program programming this code. Yeah, but this uh, contextual alternates codes uh, that I just, um, or the contextual alternates feature that I just uh, showed you is only one feature from so many. We also saw in the morning from Lila a lot of open type features, but um, here I have um, some more collected from my Liebegerda font. So for example, in this font there are stacked ligatures. And with this feature active, you will automatically, when you type A, N, and D in a row, um, the three letters will, will be automatically l replaced by this one more decorative character. Then in the second line, you see, um, because script fonts usually are too curly to typeset them in all caps, so I made for each <coughs> for each uppercase letter a less swashy um, version and you will all, uh, automatically get these versions if you activate the all caps feature. A lot of fonts offer you also stylistic um, versions for some letters. For example, in text fonts you often have a two-story A in addition to the one-story A or in this font I have a Z without a descender but then also a stylistic version without the descender or this funny version of the E. And then there is a swash feature with those curly letter forms and there's open an open type feature that has all the ink drops and strokes and kringel, I don't know, ink kringel in English, um, kringel. <laughs> and <coughs> yeah, so when I tell people now of all these possibilities, all these extra characters that a font can contain. They are usually super excited and they keep asking my, me, yeah, but Ulrike, what, what do I have to enter in my keyboard? How do I access these characters? Do I need a keyboard like this that has all the extra characters on it so that I can choose them directly through this keyboard, like all these swash characters? And then I went, nah, you don't need a keyboard like that. You just use Open type features, yay, open type features. Uh, and then nobody knows what open type features are. And that is really frustrating because it takes me usually half a year up to a whole year to complete a typeface. And <coughs> and it's super frustrating when people or graphic designers don't know what open type features are or don't use them because they don't know where to find them. So when I first saw that Kentucky Fried Chicken uses my Libidoris font, I was like, yay. <laughs> but when I then, when I realized that the contextual alternates feature was enough, I was more like this. Yeah, but it's not the graphic designers to blame if all these features in a font are not used because design software does its best to hide these features from us. And even if you find them, the naming is often so bad and not at all intuitive that you can't imagine what a certain feature could be good for. So this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, we will do a short crash course. Even though I know you know already how to access open type features, but even if there's one person in the audience that does not know already, it's um, worth to show this. <coughs> but I have to have a sip of water for it first. So we will start with Adobe InDesign. <coughs> At the top and top right of the character palette, you can get the open type menu and you will get all kinds of extras. For example, I activated now the discretionary ligatures 
These ligatures are often more decorative than the standard ligatures. But of course, not all fonts have these crazy ligatures, but you will recognize if a font has a certain feature or not, if it's listed in square brackets or not. Then um, you also see that some features here, the ligatures and the contextual alternates are already checked, even if I did not check them. That's cool because ligatures and contextual alternates are always active by default in all kinds of softwares. And um, yeah, in this menu you also see um, like the small caps and you can access the different styles for the numbers. And then there is an, an, um, <coughs> an entry that is called stylistic sets. If you ever wondered what a stylistic set is supposed to be. These stylistic sets offer us, um, give us type designers the possibilities to store open type features um, in a font that are not listed in this standard menu. So for example, these catchwords could be stored in a stylistic set. So it's always good to have a second closer look and to go one level deeper in order to check what the font has um, in addition to the standard open type features. So this is all not super handy, so to have the several layers of a menu and then the naming is often, uh, who knows what that all is supposed to be. <coughs> but there's a possibility to avoid this uh, menu. You can just select one letter and you get this tiny, tiny menu that gives you all the alter uh, alternatives that this one selected letter um, has in the font. And then you can um, directly click them and get them in your text. Cool. Um, but that does not only work for one letter, but uh, also for whole words. And then you can also deactivate it again. Cool. Um, another possibility to avoid the open type menu is the character palette. So you can find the character palette through the type menu. And the character palette shows you all characters that a font contains. So I always tell graphic designers, have a look at the uh, glyphs palette because it gives you a super good overview what a font is capable of and what possibilities uh, it offers you when you design your work. <coughs> and then you can directly click on one character in the glyphs palette and get it into your text frame. Another good, cool thing about the Glyphs palette is that you can filter characters. So most fonts often have more than 1,000 characters in it, and you may be busy the whole day scrolling through this menu till you found what you were looking for. So you can just filter, for example, for the discretionary ligatures, and bam. Yeah, but maybe you boycott Adobe produ products. I wouldn't blame you. Uh, for example, you could use pages. Does someone here uh, use pages? Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. So I will give you a quick guide. So Command T is your best friend. And then you go to the small steering wheel and on click on typography and you will get this open type menu where, we, where, you, see <coughs> where you see all the open type features that you can use in the font. Another way, another way to avoid Adobe products is the Affinity Designer. Anyone? Yeah, okay. Two people, three maybe. So Affinity Designer is a, a quite cool um, alternative to Illustrator, and I think in two or three weeks there's going to be released the uh, Affinity Publisher, and uh, that's going to be an um, alternative to InDesign. And the cool thing about this software is not only that it only costs 50 euro, I think, and it's a one-time payment, no um, subscription. Uh, but the other cool um, thing about the software is that you have this one open type window that shows you all open type features in one window. So you don't have to go in several layers like in Adobe and you have a really good overview of all the features. And there are only the uh, open type features listed that are actually in the font. So there's no wasted space of um, in this interface. And what I also love is that you get this tiny mini 
preview of what a certain feature would do to your selected text. The preview is too small, but yeah, I like the idea. And also no excuse for web developers to not use open type features because all you need is a property font feature settings and the four digit open type feature layout tag. For example, here, DLYG stands for discretionary ligatures or you could access the swashes with this um, layout tag. Um, and as with uh, was what I told you, as with um, layout software, the ligatures and the discretional ligatures are active by default in most browsers. You can turn them off like this, but you should only do so if you have really good reasons to do so. Um, yeah, and then there, there are uh, really cool tools, for example, Font Drop by Victor Nübel. You can just, as the name may imply, uh, drop a font uh, on this browser window, and this um, tool will show you what is in the font, how many characters it has, which languages it supports, but of course also what kind of open type features are in the font. So for example, I dropped Libergate in, in this browser um, window and you see all the open type features that are in the font. Um, and by default, ligatures and contextual alternates are active, but you can now play around and activate other features and see how <coughs> these features would affect your text that you could type um, further down on this website. Another cool tool is Wakamai Fondue. I'm always not sure how to pronounce this, but it's, I think it's Wakamai Fondue. It's made by Rulen Niskens. And the cool thing about that is not that it does not only show you all the open type features that are in the font, it will also give you all the CSS code you need to actually use these features in your web projects. <coughs> so there's really no excuse for bad typography on the web. So I, n I now told you several times that the ligatures and contextual alternates are always active by default, right? That was a lie. <laughs> In Microsoft Words, all features have to be activated manually, even the kerning. So if you ever have to design a template in Word for a client, first thing to do, activate the kerning, please. But after all, you can activate a lot of open type features in Word. So we have, for example, the ligatures, all kinds of ligatures, contextual alternates, uh, contextual ligatures. We have um, the discretional ligatures, the standard ligatures. You can activate the contextual alternates. You have the stylistic sets that I showed you at the beginning. So you can access a lot of open type features here. And here, by the way, you have to uh, check for kerning. But there's one feature missing here. It's the it's a swash feature. You can't activate swashes in Word. I think that it's, that's quite discriminating, right? I think also Word users should be able to access swashes. That's why I always put all the features that are not listed in a standard open type menu in certain software additionally, additionally into the stylistic sets so that, for example, all Word users uh, are able to activate the swashes in their software. This, of course, all um, requires a good documentation. I always do these mini tutorials for my fonts in order to show people what the font is capable of, what possibilities the font offers them, but of course also to show them uh, where to find uh, the open type menu and what is hidden behind the bad naming of some, uh, some features. And I'm on, uh, not only doing that for Microsoft Word, but also for InDesign, and I really hope when designers see these tutorials that they get in the mood to explore the font and to see what a font is capable of and, and uh, to experiment with all these features. Yeah, but sometimes also good documentation does not help. For example, I did this um, tutorial for a client and made a custom font for him, for them. And um, I wanted to 
them to use all the extras that the font was capable of, of course, because I made a lot of alternative contextual alternates, a lot of alternative letter forms, a lot of ligatures in order to get to maintain this handmade look. And of course, I wrote a complex open type feature that was mixing all the alternatives in an intelligent way. And then a couple of weeks after I shipped the final version of the font to the client, I went to the website in order to check how the font works and wanted to get some sample. And I also asked the client if they could send me some stuff that I could use in my portfolio. And yeah, also wanted to show off a little bit. And then I took a closer look at all the, or at all the samples that I saw on the website and that the client sent me. And then I realized There were so many examples where the contextual alternates feature was turned off. For example, here, all the E's look should, should look different on the, these eyes and the double P. They, there should be no repetition of, uh, repetition of same letter forms. Ah, this was super frustrating. And at this point, I knew that there was something wrong. Because bef before when I saw my fonts on packaging without the contextual alternates feature activated or also when I saw uh, Libedoris at Kentucky Fried Chicken, I was like, yeah, okay, maybe people don't want these alternatives. Maybe they wa want the letter forms to look identical. Maybe they just turn it off because they don't want these um, handmade look. I don't know. But um, yeah, in this case, I knew that the graphic designer did not turn this feature off because, first of all, the company paid a lot of money for all these extras, but also I knew that she was absolutely fascinated ab about all the alternatives and all the rotation and that it really looked handmade. So I knew that something was not working smoothly here, and I did a little bit of research, and then I found a really nasty bug in Adobe products. And I really wanted to show them really quickly to you in, um, so that you can keep that in mind for the next time you um, design an InDesign or Illustrator. So when you open a new text frame and type your text, you get all the alternatives. So all the A's look different and all the E's look different because ligatures are active and the contextual alternates are active by default. So that's how it should be. Everything is fine. Everything is perfect. And if you go now to, <coughs> to the glyphs palette in order to check what the font offers you, because that's what I always tell graphic designers, have a look at the glyphs menu because you can instantly see what is, um, uh, also what's in the font and then you select uh, this different style for the E, uh, for the A, sorry. Cool. And if you now copy this text frame, because it already has the right angle, the right um, text size, and then you select all and type something new. Oh. All the A's look different. Why is that? Ah, because suddenly uh, the ligatures are turned off and the contextual alternates are turned off. I did not turn them off. It's only because I selected one letter through the glue palette. Yeah, super frustrating. The problem, mm, the problem with that is that if you're not accidentally the type designer of this font, you probably won't see that these both do these two features are no, not active anymore, right? And if you're in a hurry and maybe you have to deliver for a deadline, then yeah, the contextual alternates are turned off and you won't recognize that that the features are not uh, active anymore. <coughs> That's why I have a new hobby. I um, now write open type features that can't be overseen. So you will definitely see of the, uh, if this feature is active or not. For example, I made um, this font that detects automatically if a letter is standing at the beginning or at the end of a word and then <coughs> um, um, replaces the standard le letter always with this fish fishy version so the, that the fish is growing out of the words. You will definitely see if this feature is active or not, right? <coughs> so another example um, for my not yet released Agate, Liebe Agate font, um, I was um, thinking about what else makes handwritten text so special? What's, what does only exist in analog writing? 
And I was like, ah, yeah, you can't uh, tell command Z when you write, right? You, have, you can't just delete um, text. You have to strike it through, and then you have these. And also, like, do you remember? Do you, uh, did you do that when you were a child, when you wrote a letter, and then you were trying to um, cover with a heart the stuff that was not, yeah? <laughs> so I wanted to get this feeling also in my fonts. And then another oh, uh, and then another example of open type feature I already showed you these stand dancing letters, right? So yes, this feature is active. <laughs> yeah. So these fonts that I just showed you um, may not be very handy for everyday use. I mean, imagine, imagine typesetting your annual report with those dancing letters. Um, but I think they show in, in a nice, playful way what a feature, uh, what a font is capable of, thanks to open type features. And I think they maybe encourage people to check around, uh, to play around with these feature features and to check what a font is um, capable of and what extra um, features or what extras the font uh, offers them. Allora, come si dice in italiano? <laughs> Coming to the end, I want to encourage uh, you, all you type, de uh, all you graphic designers and web designers here in the audience. Um, whenever you buy fonts, check if the font uh, comes with a booklet or a tutorial. Check the specimens of the font because type designers spend a lot of time and a lot of a lot of laugh um, for, um, in order to add all kinds of extras for you into the font in order to make it more flexible and more adaptable for your personal needs and for your um, special projects. So please make a type designer happy and use more open type features. Thank you so much.